Welcome back into that Tommy teaching series as we continue to teach through the, the Gospel of John. And we're in John in the section speaking about John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So let's go right back to where we left off in our last session. Let's read the Word of God, please, and let's go open our Bibles into first into John chapter 1. And let's begin to look at verse 6, 7, and 8, where we're going to focus all of our attention is on verse 8. Eight. There came a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify about the light so that, he says, all might believe through him he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Look at verse 8 very carefully. This sets up the model for the pastor, for the preacher, for the evangelist. Look at this as the person who leads people in the Word of God, which is to lead them to the cross of Christ, lead them to the person of Christ. He said he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Just think about that very carefully. If we live in a day and age where we're so busy promoting ourselves, promoting our ministries, promoting our logos, promoting all, everything is about us. It's about us for and no more kind of mentality where we've exalted ourselves to the level of Christ. John the Baptist never did that. And, that's, and we've been studying through this gospel. And we're still in chapter one at the very, very beginning. Look at this. So great was the light. So great must it be to be the light. Think about that. That indeed for all of the fallen race, that no anthropos, no human being, or any sin-born creature like ourselves, not even John the Evangelist, John the Apostle, okay, the greatest of the prophets, okay, or that of any other John, okay, the foremost of the evangelists, could ever be the light. One of the problems and struggles that we face is that so many of us are so busy promoting our ministry, my ministry, and yet the greatest of the prophets, John the Baptist, never ever did that. He allowed Christ to exalt him, but he also allowed John the Apostle to keep him in his proper place. Look, all that these men at most can do, the only thing that we can at most do, think about this, okay, is to testify and witness concerning the light. And even then, we need an especial, especial enabling power to do so. We are incapable of testifying about the light, and the light is Jesus in of ourselves. If it was not for the indwelling of the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When you I think about Saint Augustine, okay? and he writes that there he writes that 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 these men who came to testify about the light are like the trees and the mountains upon which the sun shines. That's all they are. We're like trees and mountains as the sun shines upon us, okay? Which reflect the light and show by their own brightness and the beauty that a great, wonderful light, vaster and mightier than they, is shining above them. That's how we're supposed to be. That's how St. Augustine spoke in those days. He, he, he likened us to, to the trees and the mountains of which the, the light just shined upon. But you know what happened? In, 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 but the truth is, is that the light in the mountains, let me tell you, the tree in the mountains, okay, is not as important as the light that's upon them. You know, our ministries are not all that important if it was not for the light of Jesus Christ. So it's in this particular sense. I mean, let me ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verse 35. Look at this carefully with me. Look. Because it's in this particular sense, okay? And I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 5, verse 35, okay? And, and that, that, that Christ himself calls the Baptist. He calls John the Baptist, okay? A burning and shining light. Can you imagine that the light, Jesus, calls John the Baptist, who came to testify about the light, as a burning, shining light? Look at this. In John chapter 5, verse 35, he says, 
He was the lamp and was burning and was shining. And you were willing to rejoice for a while, for a while in his light. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus could come and shine in the light of John the Baptist, not because John was greater, but because Jesus elevated him to a point that people could see that he was someone's pointing to Christ. Now, I want to be very careful with this part because the evangelist, John the Apostle, okay? I want you to see this with me, okay? John the Apostle here, okay? Uh, he's very, very careful. He's extremely careful to follow, and he does something that's quite unique. He makes a negative statement and a positive statement at the same time. This is what John the Baptist is, I mean, John the Apostle is doing. Look at this. And so the evangelist is careful to follow the negative statement concerning what John was not, okay? With the positive statement concerning what he truly was. And he makes this a repetition or a clause, if you will, and it's used over and over again. Look, go back to John chapter 1, verse 7. Go to John chapter 1, verse 7. I want you to say this. Because what he's doing, he's securing, okay, a special emphasis here as to what John the Baptist was and what he was not. In John chapter 1, verse 7, look at what he says. He says, he came as a witness to testify about the light, do you see that? So that all might believe through him. Do you see that? So here's the positive statement that he makes about John the Baptist. Right? And that's true of all of us who are in the ministry. It's true of all of us who are Christians. Right? Yeah? That we come as a witness to testify about the light. Okay? So that all might believe so that all might believe, can you see that, okay, through him, that they can see through us who the living Christ is. Now, but then in verse 8, John chapter 1, verse 8, okay, he says, he was not the light, okay, but he came to testify about the light. I think sometimes we lose sight about what we are and what we are not. And we need to be reminded of that, okay? Now, think what this means personally, just for a moment with us, okay? In the first place, John the Baptist was aware that he was not the light. I think sometimes we've lost sight of that, that we're not the light. We're not the light. Listen, and this is important. Why? Simply because all successful witnessing to Jesus Christ must start with this self-realization. It has to start with this. We are not the light. We're not all that important. Okay? You know, we, we are not the object of faith. We are an agent of faith by way of the person of the Holy Spirit, but we're not the object of faith. Look, whenever a Christian layman, whenever a Christian minister, whenever a Christian writer, or whenever a Christian teacher, or whoever it might be, Okay? gets to thinking that there's something important about him, about us, he or she will always cease to be effective as Christ's witness. And the testimony will stop because it all becomes, because it becomes all about you. It becomes all about me. Listen to me. Unfortunately, this has been true of many Christians and of many important Christian movements. We become bigger than God in our own eyes. Go back to John chapter 1, verse 8. The simplicity and the profundity of this verse should shake us to the very core. Because in John chapter 1, verse 8, he says, He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Second thing I want to talk to you about is that John bore witness. He bore witness to the light. And this is important also. Why? Because there's always many, uh, there's always a lot of shy and there's always a lot of uncertain Christians who feel, now let's be careful with this, 
who feel that they are bearing a witness, okay, simply because they're living the Christian faith or they're refusing to do certain things and doing others. Uh, they, they refuse to do certain things and they, and they want to do other things, okay? Well, listen, they live at work, okay? They live at school. They live in their homes. Unfortunately, important as it may be, this is not in itself witnessing. And that's big. That's a big challenge that we face today. Is that we have a lot of believers who, well, I'm a faithful believer. I'm a Christian at work. I'm a Christian when I walk when I go to school. I'm a Christian in my home. But that's just about it. They never actually testify to the light of Jesus Christ. They try to be the light of Jesus Christ. Look, it is what the author of the book. Okay, Paul Little, his name was Paul Little. He wrote a book and, he, and, he, and it's called How to Give Away Your Faith. That's this is a book that he wrote, okay? And, and, and it was a little helpful, stimulating book, and it was, okay? Of which he calls pre-evangelism, okay? This idea of how to give your faith away, right? And, and let me tell you something. He says, living the faith is the most essential basis for any effective witness. That's what he says in his book, right? And he says, but if we do not live, okay, what we profess, okay, the profession will be completely discredited. Isn't that true of a lot of people? They can raise their hands and say, hallelujah, amen, glory to God, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, but they don't live what they profess. Yet living the faith is not itself witnessing. You know, and that's the biggest problem. People walk around and go, well, I'm a Christian and I live the faith. Okay? But they never open their mouth. They never testify to the light that is Jesus Christ. Listen, witnessing is speaking. Witnessing is speaking to others about Jesus Christ. We all understand that. Listen, and this is implied in the very word itself when we talk about the word testifying. For witnessing is a legal term. It's a legal term that points to verbal testimony rendered in the court of law. That's what witnessing is. That is what a witness is. He's sworn to testify, okay? So if we're to do this effectively like John the Baptist did, okay, we must be able to tell who Jesus Christ is. What he said about the depravity of man's nature, but no, 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 nobody wants to talk about the depravity of man's nature. We Witnessing is why his death and his resurrection are essential, why the essential elements in the solution to the problem of man's sin and his depravity. So that's what we're doing. We're witnessing, we're giving verbal testimony. We don't dress like a Christian and walk like a Christian. I have no idea what that is, no clue what that is. And how is it that somebody comes into a relationship with Jesus personally? This is witnessing. You have to actually open your mouth. It requires verbal testimony. Finally, the witness must be given, okay, must be given with the belief of other persons in Jesus Christ as its object. What am I saying that? Look, John, we are told, bore witness to the light. Go back to John 1, 7. Look at this very carefully. You know, it's the simplicity of the word that we seem to overlook. We just kind of over, we just go right over it, okay? Look, go back. Look at what he says in John chapter 1, verse 7. He says, he came as a witness, right, to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. Look at this carefully. Look, you just slow down. He came as a witness. You and I are supposed to come as a witness. That's what we're supposed to do. To testify about the light, that's Jesus, okay? So that all might believe through him. People come to the cross because, A, we speak about the light, we speak about Jesus, and they see us. Mm -hmm. They see our testimony, but we, we are verbal witnesses so that they may come to him, okay, through us. Listen to me. It should be almost unnecessary to mention this, of course, but it is obvious. Listen. Yet it is necessarily simple because it is possible 
for a person to become a, a soul. You know, sometimes we become so mechanical in our witness. You know, we come up with these little cute formulas, point one, point two, point three, 1, 2, 3, right? That we can go through all of the motions of witnessing without actually looking and praying for the response of Christ in the faith of another person. No. You see, this is the reason why a lot of people don't like to witness is because the, their relationship with Christ is, is very mechanical. It's very dry. Look, listen, if we could remember this, then we are called to testify as a witness by how we live through the Word of God on a daily basis. But to, we're always to point to the light. That is Jesus, okay? You know, then we would find witnessing exciting. Look, we would learn that winning the argument often becomes far less important than winning the person to the Lord. I don't have to win every argument. It is not, it's not necessary. I just don't have to. Go back to John chapter 1. Look at this. I want you to see this. And I, let's, let's kind of just kind of put this in this context. Okay? Because everything is in the Word. It's in the Word. Okay, It's not in the preacher. It's not in the woman of God. It's not in the man of God. It's in the Word. Look. Go back and look what he says in John chapter 1 verse 6. He says, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist, right? And he, John the Baptist, came as a witness to do what? To testify about the light, that is Jesus, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, okay? But he came to testify by the light. Now, I want you to see something very carefully because, and this is crucial. And it's crucial, you know, at first you don't kind of make, you don't make the connection, but let me see if I can help you make the connection. In my, in, in my poor way of trying to explain things. Look, there, this is what we would call an absolutely abrupt change. It's a radical change of subject from the exalted Lord Jesus Christ to, you know, who's the eternal self-existing creator God, okay, to a mere man sent from God. It's absolutely striking. Look, Go back with me to verse 1. I want you to see this because, I, and I'm going to try, I'm going to attempt to make the connection here. Look. In verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, let's read it. You see the self exalted Christ. Look at this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that was coming to being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I mean, this is just overwhelming when you see this, okay? And then there's an over, there is this abrupt, radical, striking change in the whole language when we go from verse 5 to verse 6. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify by the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There came a man. Is actually what he's saying, there appeared. There appeared a man, and, and is indicating a major shift here, okay? From the heavenly word, from the heavenly word, okay, to an earthly herald. Stop. That's the problem today. Everybody's promoting their ministry. It's all about them. They're the center of they're the center of attention. The greatest of the prophets, John the Baptist. And what John the Evangelist, John the Apostle, is doing, he's putting John the Baptist in his proper place. Not because John the Baptist was out of order, no. But it's an indication, it's a picture for you and I to be reminded who we are and who we are not. Listen, when we, we just finished reading verses 1 through 5, right? Okay, After describing the Word, capital L, capital W, right? The Word, right? Who was God. John now turned to the one who announced 
that the Word was God. He, now he turns his attention to John the Baptist. The herald's name was John the Baptist. Now, John the Apostle does not name himself, okay, in his gospel whatsoever. That's the reason why I told you at the very beginning that we have to be reminded that three Johns in the book of John, okay? And we know that John the Apostle, John the Evangelist, is speaking, right? And he speaks to John the, uh, uh, the Baptist and Peter's father, John. And you have to kind of make a distinction everywhere to find out who is speaking. Listen, John the Apostle, okay, does not name himself okay, in his gospel. So every time you see the name John appears, it refers to John the Baptist, except for four times, four references to Peter's father, okay? Let me show you this, because it's important. Um, in John chapter 1, verse 42, uh, here are the exceptions. In John chapter 1, verse 42, it says, He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So here, John, the son of John, is Peter's father. Well, go to John chapter 21, all the way at the end of the book. In John chapter 21, look at verse 15, 16, and 17. Okay? So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, this is Peter's father, right? And he says, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, then tend my lamps. In verse 16, he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep, right? And then in verse 17, he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. He said, because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. Do you see that? So the, the person that John the Evangelist, John the Apostle is speaking to is about John the Baptist. But we do see four different times that the other John is Peter's father. Now go back to John chapter 1 verse 6. Go back to John chapter 1 verse 6. This is crucial. He said, there came a man sent from God. Do you see that? It's in the text here. He said, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. Now when you see that phrase, okay, sent from God. What is it doing? It confirms John's role as a herald, okay, as an announcer in several ways. First, the Baptist, John the Baptist, had a divine commission as one who fulfilled the Old Testament's prophecies regarding the Messiah as a forerunner. <clears throat> so, um, you know, the, the Bible is not disconnected. It's connected. This one author... 40 different uh, secretaries, right? Each author, each writer was a secretary, an emanuets, okay? To, an emanuets is the word in Latin for, for, for secretary. But there's one author, and that's God the Father, okay? And he executes that word through the person of the Holy Spirit, touching the lives of the individual people who wrote out, who wrote the word out for us, so that we would have the benefit of the word of God today. Look, so John the Baptist is connected to the Old Testament. Turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Look at this, because Isaiah predicted him. John the Baptist didn't just appear out of nowhere for no reason. No, he's fulfilling a prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, look at this. A voice is calling. And it says, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Well, it's not only there. Go now jump back into the New Testament with me. Go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Look at this. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, when he said, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make ready, he says, the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Do you see that? Well, go over one more book. Go to the book of Mark. And let's go to Mark chapter 1. 
And in Mark chapter 1, I want you to see in verse 2 and 3, verse 2 and 3, Mark chapter 1. As it is now. Remember, why are we sharing this? Because in John chapter 1, verse 6, okay, he said, there came a man sent from God. In Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger, a reference to John the Baptist, ahead of you who will prepare your way. He says, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Do you see that? Now, John the Baptist is the greatest of the prophets. And it's really crucial to understand this crucial role that he played. You know, do you realize that the Old Testament closes with Malachi's prophecy of this Elijah-like prophet to come before the day of the Lord, okay? Which the angel of the Lord told Zacharias, and he was referring to John. Stay with me in the Gospels. Go to the book of Luke. Look at this in the book of Luke with me. Now, Luke, we can see this in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. But I want to show it to you and connect the dots with So, Hold your place in Luke chapter 1. And now we just mentioned Malachi, right? So look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Look at what he says. He says, he says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, his coming, says the Lord of hosts. Well, stay with me, Malachi. Hold your place in Luke. In Malachi chapter 4, look at what he says about in verse 5 and 6. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children, he says, to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now we see this fulfillment, okay? which is what he's talking about in John chapter 1, verse 6, when he says, there came a man sent from God. Okay? Well, look at Luke chapter 1. I asked you to hold your place in Luke chapter 1. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And he says this, it is he who will go as a forerunner, a precursor, Okay? before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, secondly, let's pick this up. Stay with me in Luke chapter 1. The Baptist, John the Baptist, was uniquely sent from God. Why? Because his conception and his birth were miraculous as well. Since his parents were old and had never had children. So he plays a very special role and he comes into role in a very special way so that everybody would listen to him. In Luke chapter 1 verse 7, we read verse 17, but go back, just back up 10 verses and go to verse 7. He says, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. This is a miraculous birth as well. Well, in that same book of Luke, chapter 1, go all the way down to verse 36. Verse 36. Look what he says. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth, Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Do you see that? Third, the angel, the angel of the Lord, came from heaven to speak to Zacharias, to tell Zacharias, okay, that he and Elizabeth would have a son who would be the herald, would be the spokesperson, the person pointing toward the light, Jesus, okay, the herald of the Messiah. Again, remember what he said in John chapter 1, verse 6, he said, there came a man sent from God. Now, stay with me in Luke. Just drop back down to verse 8. Luke chapter 1, verse 8. Luke chapter 1, verse 8. And look with me from verse 8 down to verse 17. Look at this. 
Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, right? According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside of the hour of incense offering. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at right at the right altar of the incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. Because you typically, when you saw an angel, that was not good news. Right? And verse 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth okay, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name of John. This is John the Baptist. In verse, and he says, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Verse 15. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. <coughs> Excuse me. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Verse 17. It is he who will go as a forerunner, before him in the spirit and in the power look at this in the spirit and in the power of elijah to turn back look what he says to turn back to the children and the disobedient of the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the lord we can clearly see this was an important man a miraculous birth he was one of the most important the most important of all the prophets Yet, he understood he was a man who was sent from God and remained a humble servant of the Lord.